Gone. I'm trying to wait till there's like a break. <laughs> oh, perfect. <laughs> People start coming on. Well, welcome, friends, uh, to the Athenaeum of Philadelphia's afternoon programming. We're so pleased to have you here with us today. Uh, if you don't know me, I'm Beth Hessel, the executive director. We also have Tess Galen, our events coordinator, here with us on the screen and our special guest today. If you're new to the Athenaeum, I hope that you enjoy today's program and that it inspires your interest to come and visit us and learn more about our community of um, individuals, members who are committed to history and literature, reading, architecture, preservation, Philadelphia, all things Philadelphia. Uh, we'd love to have you a part of our community. Our special guest today is Aaron Workington. He describes himself as an armchair historian, bibliophile, and museum professional who is currently serving as a curator with the B.R. Howard Conservation uh, Team. He also enjoys visiting Civil War and Pennsylvania's industrial history sites. Uh, I talked with us a little bit while we were, we were getting started here about his uh, love of, of pre-World War, pre-war automobiles and the work he's done with various museums on, on that. So that's a, another topic. I invite you all to join me in warmly welcoming Aaron Workington to the Athenaeum of Philadelphia. Hello. Uh, thank you very much, Athenaeum, for uh, inviting me out to uh, do this presentation about the uh, Pennsylvania uh, form building. And we're going to have a slideshow. I'll just introduce myself, but the slideshow will allow uh, the viewers to see the work that's going on in terms of the restoration and preservation of uh, the library section of the education building. So why don't I share my screen here? I'm gonna put up my PowerPoint and uh, we will begin. Does everybody see the, uh, the program, the PowerPoint program? If I can give me one moment so I can start the slideshow here. Is that viewable to everybody? Okay, fantastic. Okay, so uh, what we have here on the uh, front panel is actually a postcard um, just after the construction of the State Forum building, as they called it, which includes both the law library, the general library, and the auditorium, and then also a vintage photo out of their commemorative uh, booklet that they created in 1932 showing the actual uh, room, the general library, where B.R. Howard and Associates and uh, our conservators are working to uh, preserve that, uh, that part of the building. Um, what the presentation will actually focus on is the work specifically there. It's a $90 million renovation and uh, conservation project um, for the entire structure. And uh, it is currently slated to be completed in January of next year, 2023. So we're looking forward to seeing the final product. Uh, we're one of several different contractors actually working in different uh, areas of the building. Uh, what we have here is um, the Capitol, uh, Capitol campus. Uh, what I want to bring up is you'll notice down in the center towards the lower area, there is a semicircular uh, building. That is the building we're referring to, the education building, its original name often called the Forum now. Uh, it was developed uh, by the or for the purpose of actually creating a very holistic and aesthetically uniform campus. This was all developed in the early 20th century. And what the idea behind what the Commonwealth was trying to do with the Capitol building was to actually create a, a legacy through using neoclassical architecture. You'll notice across the soldiers commemorative park is actually the finance building. That was all designed by the architects of um, Grohant or Girond and Ross. They were actually well-known architects on the East, uh, East Coast. And you also see the Sailors and Soldiers Memorial Bridge just between those two buildings. That was also a part of their architectural uh, development. So the building itself, uh, the Forum Building, uh, which began construction around 29, which was actually before the uh, Black Thursday or the stock market crash. 
it would take about three years, not dedicated until September 16th of 31. Um, it would be dedicated after the Great Depression began. As I had mentioned, it was designed by Grohan and Ross. Um, this was built specifically for the education department. Of course, public education at that point was really growing. It was a very important part of uh, government life and the importance of educating the young, no matter whether rural or urban. And they wanted this building to be uh, a monument, actually, a long-standing monument to education to the develop, development of knowledge, hence why the law library and the general library were also incorporated. Uh, according to the commemorative uh, booklet that was created, which I'll talk a little more about, they quoted as, the building is a veritable record of the history of mankind. So not only did it preserve the knowledge of the past, the plan was to continue to expand it to preserve knowledge into the future. Uh, you'll notice, on the right is actually a scan page out of that commemorative book showing the completed um, building. So this is the booklet I have mentioned already several times. A very beautiful um, embossed cover. Its purpose was to help increase the prestige and explain how important the forum building was to uh, both the state of Pennsylvania and to mankind in general. There is a lot, I'm sure a lot of uh, state employees who will be watching this have been through the building and they'll see all, they've seen all the interior architecture and the idea or the purpose of all the motifs was to show how man built upon man's knowledge and continued to evolve to the state that man was in in 1931. So this is the general uh, library. This is what we'll be speaking about. This is where B.R. Howard and Associates is involved. And um, what uh, we're gonna go through is we're gonna talk about the different components. So we worked on both the metal railings or the balustrades and all the wood veneer, uh, which was both in the columns, as you can see in this photo, and also the radiator covers, which is a different process but I'll talk about all three of these components. Uh, I did find actually uh, interesting statistics that the, there's 25 miles of shelving and over 3.7 million individual items of books and microfilm and everything in between. So that tells you the vast amount of uh, storage needed and to the vast amount of knowledge being cared for. So we'll start out with the balustrades. I've been uh, intimately involved in this. I've been part of the project team in order to uh, clean and care for these uh, very unique um, kind of art deco neoclassical uh, balustrades. The three photos show the three different motifs being used. Every floor had a different design uh, and the book says following classical motifs, it reads all three, oh, all metal balustrades, which in classic severity encompass the room. There is no repetition of hackneyed designs. All three balustrades are different following classical motifs, but so varied as to be seen as extremely modern. So I don't know if they, the authors of the booklet just wanted to pontificate or they were just overjoyed to see the, uh, the design and the overwhelming uh, uh, <laughs> classical motifs, as they said. So how did we go through caring for the balustrades? Well, here you can see actually two little uh, components. Hopefully you can kind of see that one is uh, uncleaned, it has not been dealt with yet. And then the bottom piece is actually what it looks like after it went through our cleaning process and resealing. So we had to disassemble, clean, seal, and then reassemble. And those were processes we had to slowly work through by doing one, uh, one unit at a time. Here's our disassembly process. So we had to take care that when we disassembled it, all the components stayed together. These are not interchangeable. 
every railing was actually serialized. So each railing had a very specific number and all parts were, had that serial number attached to it. So when we took these apart, you may, it may be a little difficult to see, but the image on the left shows a medallion. Those are from the seventh floor. Each medallion had a serial number to them. As they were being assembled in the late 20s, but, uh, they were assembling these to each individual space. If they had to adjust for width, height, or to make sure, especially the seventh floor, which had an extremely intricate design, they would shave, they would adjust, cut, and uh, work everything together. You cannot interchange the parts. It was imperative that we kept these organized. You'll see in the image on the right how we laid out all the pieces to make sure that there was no confusion and no parts commingled. Here is what the cleaning process began looking like. You can see on the left is an image. Uh, it shows both a, a cleaned component uh, and the dirty components. What you see that's dirty is a lot of, is 80 years of cleaning products, sometimes cleaned off, sometimes were um, maybe too, a little too much was applied. A lot of this is waxes, and so this built up. Um, and the difficult part is because they're indoors, they did not weather. So a lot of um, a lot of the cleaning product simply kept building upon itself and actually created a, a thick layer. We went through clean that um, before we began the sealing. You'll see down in the row lower right corner the bronze or oh, I apologize brass components. Those actually are the balls that go on the feet. Um, of the railings. Uh, we had an outside vendor who specifically worked or works with brass. He went through and cleaned. You can see uh, that upper bowl, which is very tarnished and dirty. That's it, what takes place through oxidation um, over time. And then the product after he, was, uh, he had cleaned it and lacquered and sealed it. Uh, the upper right image actually shows the inside and explains how difficult this process was. Not only did we have to clean the faces, we had to clean the insides of each component. And so that took a variety of tools. So what are those tools? We had two different machine tools and two different hand tools that allowed us to complete the process of cleaning. Uh, you'll notice in the lower Left corner is a machine that's often used for planing uh, wood components. We actually worked with a machine shop and modified it to help us clean the aluminum. Uh, we also had to clean those insides, which I mentioned. So we used that tool in the upper right. And then we also used hand tools so that we could control the amount of pressure that we were using to remove the material. We were very cognizant that we wanted to remove as little as possible. Of course, aluminum can scuff. Uh, it can also be, a lot of material can be removed. And so we were constantly variating the pressure. And we were always aware of um, that we wanted to reduce the amount of material loss. Here are uh, more photos showing how we organized um, on pallets, how we labeled everything. We made sure you'll see in those little bags is actually all the original fasteners, which were hand cleaned and then placed back in a bag. So the fasteners that were removed from the railing units went back to that same railing unit. We did, once again, we didn't mix anything. They are interchangeable, but we did not want to take the chance on having a situation where fasteners were actually custom modified. We didn't want to have those confused with other units. Now you can actually see on the image on the left, actually the serial numbers. This particular unit was 981. And once again, um, you'll also notice that there's a one far to the left of that serial number. This, these particular balustrades, when they were disassembled, we found that every single uh, component um, for instance, these lattices were actually 
numbered. So you have to put them in that order or the railing will actually not go back together properly. It will be, um, it actually, it simply won't fit. We actually did a test fit to see what the interchangeability was and we realized there was no, you have to follow the way that the original craftsman uh, constructed them. So the reassembly, this was a very interesting process because once again, although we did all that organization on the front end, trying to reassemble some of these, <laughs> these very intricate designs, particularly on the seventh floor, which had the uh, Native American swastika uh, motif, because uh, they had to make this all fit, sometimes they would start cut us and cutting the lattices so we had to make sure that these lattices, that those components touched the right components. We couldn't, well, even within the railing unit, we could not intermix. We had to make sure we went in order. And you can see this process here. Uh, this is one unit I'm laying out, placing all of the medallions, which themselves are all numbered. And they all had to go in a certain order or they wouldn't fit with the lattices. And so this is from uh, left to right. So. How did we maintain um, quality control, especially when we had three teams here at our studio working on this? I constructed the first unit and then I created a procedure or an instructional uh, sheet. And this was printed out for each team so that they understood the order in which uh, the pieces would go together. And I had to do this with every single railing we've done so far. We still have a whole nother set of railings to go through. So we've only done, I would say, 65% of the railings so far. So you can see how this is a time consuming process, but it's well worth, well worth the final product. Here's another example. Because of each design, it requires different techniques. You can see this is the sixth level, no, actually the fifth level balustrades. Everything's laid out in order. We put out all the medallions, and I even lay out all the fasteners so that they're, uh, so I know exactly the different lengths that are supposed to go to different components. The right uh, side image actually shows the fact that these particular lattices actually act as a spring. When we disassembled them, we noticed they began distorting because they were no longer under tension. So as we constructed them, we had to go from corner, like the top right corner, to the bottom left corner. And while we were doing this, we had to slowly pinch them together and use um, different uh, vices in order to make sure everything lined up and all the medallions fit perfectly. And hopefully you can see here the difference between the uh, a for and after image of uh, a particular uh, railing unit. So, and then once we're finished with them, we make sure we, uh, I would actually go through a check, make sure for quality control that uh, all the fasteners are tight, uh, everything is in place, and then we wrap them so that before, even before they're installed, or even during install installation, we're actually having, keeping them wrapped. So we use a thick polyethylene in order to protect them from scuffing or damage. So here's the next part of the process that's a uh, very uh, large time consuming. Once again, very well worth what we're doing to preserve this place of knowledge is the veneer on all the columns. You can see the columns. They uh, rise all the way to the ceiling. They include trim, both flat and curved components. Uh, we had to clean. We then documented um, anything that would need to have repairs, and then we uh, did a stain and finish. So here is the tests that we did. We started the cleaning process, you can see on the left, and then on the right was the test to make sure that we could get the correct uh, hue, the correct um, look of the finish as it was originally intended. Uh, so the original finish was actually a cellulose nitrate, uh, very commonly used back um, 
before the mid-century. But as time went on, some places were refinished because of damage. Uh, some places were um, highly clean, polished. And a lot of this over time, it can actually change the, the hue. So a good example is using palm olive for 20 years. Uh, once a week, it will actually start changing the color of the finish. And that's just what takes place during the care and uh, cleaning. So here is a, an after and a before. It shows what we're trying to get to, uh, what, what you will see once all the wood is done. And the thing to remember is what, when I'm talking about the veneer, it's just not the columns of the atrium itself. There are radiator covers, the window casings in the genealogy section. There's also um, other wood fixtures. So we're actually handling all the wood in the library area. So, you know, two to three square miles of, uh, of wood potentially. <laughs> that may be an exaggeration, but it feels like a lot, I will say that. Here's a documenting process. So once we did the cleaning, uh, once we had to strip away because the finish um, was uh, damaged, I mean, we tried to preserve finish where we could, but ultimately we realized we would have to remove that finish and refinish it in uh, appropriate uh, water-based uh, finish. So once that was all stripped away, I began going around to every single panel that we were going to be working on and actually documenting uh, damage, anything that had to be repaired. You'll see on the left, I would actually go through and mark with painter's tape um, potential areas of repair. And then I actually created a sheet, which you see on the right, and I documented every single um, crack or uh, potential damage. And then we would evaluate where or how far we would go in the repair. And I'll show you what, uh, what that looks like here. So here's an example. You'll notice on the left uh, that there is a crack. That piece of veneer detached, uh, delaminated, and broke away. So how will we repair that? Of course, we're not going to use wood putty. We have uh, pieces of veneer that are also similar to and actually are uh, Mexican mahogany, which is what is listed as being the um, the wood veneer that was used. Uh, I want to bring up real quickly about the Mexican mahogany. Uh, it had been brought up by other people, not, not ourselves as we per, uh, prefer to preserve, but sometimes we'd hear construction workers like, well, why don't we just, why don't you guys just replace them, uh, the veneer? Well, we can't because Mexican mahogany is actually an endangered species. We would not be able to import the mahogany from uh, Central America where it grows along the Pacific coast. So we have to preserve, we have to repair and care for uh, the paneling that we have on display right now at the library. So we would take a piece of uh, Mexican mahogany here. You'll see the center photo. I actually cut a piece that's e uh, in a shape that's easily uh, replicatable. So you'll see on the right is actually the fill-in. And that will essentially disappear. You won't even notice that that was a fill-in. And it appears that over time, there's been actually quite a lot of uh, repair done to the veneer. So you will actually, as I was going through, I actually listed down previous work that had been done before we even got there. So you can actually see variations and differences in that work. This is another way that we would uh, repair the veneer. Some of the veneer had actually detached in large sections, uh, a couple square feet at a time, and we would use high glue organic uh, made out of, um, or many of you may know what high glue is, it uses uh, animal extract, and we would use that by injecting it behind the panels and then using uh, plexiglass wrapped in mylar, and we would then pinch those together and let those sit for over 24 hours. And then we'd come back, warm them up using a heating iron and allow that all to cure. 
and so that would all sit nice and flush against the wood substrate. So it is a process. Uh, it usually, it took us about uh, three, three and a half weeks just to do the top floor, but what is going to come out of it is going to be great. It's gonna look phenomenal. And uh, finally, I just wanna talk about the radiator covers. Uh, the radiator covers, as you can see, were where the heating um, units uh, were installed. Uh, they are a uh, complex shape made of several different panels. And of course, they took a lot of uh, beating by the operation of the heaters, which were uh, water heaters. So we removed all those um, so that new high efficiency units could be installed. And we have a gentleman, an Amish uh, gentleman who's very good craftsman, and he repaired and rebuilt in some cases the uh, units. Here you can see one at our shop uh, being mounted on uh, the new uh, supports. And th this is before our finishing work was, uh, was performed. And this is our, our current finishing work. We are still in the process. I'm involved in the finishing product. So you can see on the right is actually after they are stripped and we're preparing to stain them. And then on the left is actually the final product. How it's gonna be nice and brilliant. You're gonna see the character of the wood, uh, which once again, as time goes on and the original finish kind of starts breaking down after 80 years, you kind of lose that character, but that's all gonna be brought back to the floor. So um, I just wanna thank uh, once again the Athenaeum for welcoming me to uh, be able to show off what, what is being done and how we're preserving historical architecture and the knowledge in our state. Of course, B.R. Howard, who's allowed me to uh, work with them and our forum crew, who's uh, very focused, great guys who work very hard and understand the importance of uh, preserving uh, this history and of course the Pennsylvania State Library because without them we wouldn't have this this great example of uh, of architecture and history so thank you Aaron this is it's stunning to see the difference um, and, and I think you know well if you if we never visited to see it once it's done but if you have and to be able to see it from with new eyes uh, it's, it's just wonderful so thank you um, mm -hmm. I think we have time for some questions. If uh, anybody, well, Phoebe starts, will there be tours of the library uh, that, that look at the restoration process? You may not know that. Maybe somebody else knows that. <laughs> that yeah, uh, that's definitely something uh, to talk to the state library about. And I've been in contact with the director of the state library and they're actually very excited about this process. So I'm sure once this opens up, uh, they're gonna wanna show off the uh, new environment. And Jerry's wondering when the restoration is expected to be completed. Well, the, the hope right now is uh, for January of 2023. So our component, uh, we're, we're hoping towards uh, the fall, but uh, like everything, there's always going to be adjustments. But yeah, we're, we're shooting for that final date of the whole building for January of 2023. Uh, Jim is getting specifics. What's the substrate for the veneer? Oh, the substrate, um, it, it was a common wood. I think they, it was an oak, I believe. Uh, don't quote me on that because I haven't worked on the substrate. We never removed any of the panels. And uh, so we've only worked on the outside of the panels. We, there was some discussion about removing some of the panels to do work on, but we were too nervous about disturbing their placement. So. Uh, but good question. Uh, I apologize. I couldn't give give a specific answer. <laughs> he says pre plywood. <laughs> <laughs> Very, but yes, they're very heavy. I will tell you that. <laughs> um, uh, Dennis, I'm um, gonna combine a question from Dennis and from someone. I just have a, a number here. Um, how are you documenting the restoration process, and will that be archived at the state library? Well, that that's a good question. Um, we are documenting both through photography. We are documenting also by uh, developing diagrams. So uh, another thing we've been discussing is actually doing video, videography, so that we can actually show uh, 
I think that would be a good one that was kind of thrown around, showing the process of actually working on a specific area. In terms of its archiving, we do archive it here at the studio. We will have it on our website, but if the state library also uh, desires uh, this information, uh, we're more than willing to provide that so that they themselves can have this uh, on file. Fantastic, and Mary who works there says she looks forward to cataloging that collection. <laughs> um, <laughs> so that's good, that's good that she's looking forward to that. Uh, Tess is wondering if there are elements of the building that are not included in this stage of the restoration that would need restoration work in the future that you know of. Well, I know there's been discussion related to the lobby area where a lot of the marble and sculpture and bas reliefs are. Um, I don't, not for us at this point, but it's always interesting, any project on this scale, I mean, once again, I, it's a $90 million project. There could be something, and there already has been things that kind of popped up where uh, the general contractor said, hey, can you guys look into this, deal with this, and then we would adjust for that. But at this point, this is a very large project for a crew and we're very focused on this before we move on to any other potential parts or components. So I, uh, I, I find this kind of building off that the documentation that you all are doing. I know we're in a National Historic Landmark building here at the Athenaeum and um, as, as we you know try to identify work that needs to be done, sometimes it's a, a challenge to find previous documentation for work that has been mm -hmm. done. As you embarked on this project, did you find that uh, there was good documentation um, from the beginning and, and if any work had been done over over the years? Um, no. Oh, no, because I don't think people worried about such things. <laughs> 90, you know, what I use this commemorative book quite a bit and also photography like for instance i even researched through the internet to look at old photos going back 15 or 20 years in newspapers whether whatever related to with the uh, the library and there was um of course it, you know it, it's funny because when uh structures like this are built many times nobody actually thinks like oh in 90 to 100 years, somebody will have to come in and figure out how to care for all of this. It never always quite makes it to that stage. But, uh, you know, the great thing about being in a conservation studio is we know where to look. Uh, for instance, looking on the paneling, doing, taking a section and analyzing the materials used on the paneling. There's ways scientifically we're able to determine what the colors most likely were, what the hues or what it was supposed to look like. So we can do that kind of analyzation and that helps us in, in this process. Thank you. Um, BB has a question here wondering where uh, items in the library have been kept while restoration is ongoing, and uh, what if, uh, what parts of the library are currently accessible to the public, if any. I think the final question is probably outside your scope, wondering if the collection right. would be paired to allow new materials to be included. Yeah, so what they did, um, uh, what the state did was they actually hired a company that actually, instead of removing the stacks, all of the books, they actually encapsulated all of the books. To, to move millions of books would have been um, a very difficult uh, proposition, let alone, I'd feel horrible for the librarians trying to sift through all that so that the library can still function. So uh, what this company does is they actually sealed up all, all the stacks so that the librarians I know can still get in there, access books for their membership, but at the same time, they're kept safe from all the construction work because it is dusty, it is dirty. There's a lot of things going on. We're only one component. We're just doing the finishes. There are electricians, HVAC specialists, uh, people doing drywall, doing plastering. So it, uh, and of course we're having to work around all these people, trying to coordinate with them while we're doing an extremely a delicate job of cleaning and refinishing all of these surfaces and trying to maintain uh, cleanliness. So it's it's been a challenge, but you know, 
that's that's what we like to do challenges so great ellen uh who is a library there says most is covered in plastic sheeting as you said our staff transports materials to and from uh, its temporary location on 400 north street several times a week using interlibrary loan and is still open to the public and go to www.statelibrary.pa.gov for how to visit. And I that. also want to say, while I've been working there, I signed up as a member of the library and I love it, so. Fantastic. This is fantastic. This is uh, something worth test. We may have to do a, 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 a trip next year <laughs> for the Athenaeum to go visit. I, yeah. I think we still have time for a couple more questions if anybody has any they want to ask. Um, what 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 have you found was the most challenging part of this conservation project? Oh, that there, there'd probably be three items that would rank on the same level as challenging. I think one, you what was challenging was how were we going to care for the railing units, the balustrades? Uh, of course, we ended up. There have been discussions originally, should we clean them in situ, but we realized there was no way that we could get them to have their original luster and clean them properly without removing them. Then the next challenge was, oh my goodness, if we take these things apart, are we going to, you know, what is this going to look like? So because I've been so involved in the balustrade work and have actually helped in the project management of that, I would say that's that's been very challenging because we want to make sure that everything goes back as the craftsmen constructed them in 1931. So, and, and I feel we've achieved that. So. That's great. And, and Sherman is wondering if you've had to recreate or fabricate any new metal items if you if, to match and fit any missing components. So far, no. We have not been needing to do that, but uh, we have discussed that there may be a potentiality that something breaks or may have been damaged. Well, oh, a good example. We took apart one railing unit and we noticed that it had a very old break, an ancient break, probably even happened when it was constructed and installed. And there had been discussion, well, what should we do with that? And we realized that's a part of the history of that railing and it did not uh, sacrifice any of the uh, structural integrity. So we put that back into place, fixed that uh, crack. And so it's still there to this day. Hmm. Phoebe's wondering if you know anything about the original craftsmen who designed and created things like the balustrade. Uh, no, we don't. I, I hope in the process of doing this that maybe one of their descendants will come about and tell us this um, we can see their fingerprints so we may not know who they are specifically but we can literally see their fingerprints on this and we can tell that there were multiple craftsmen doing different levels or different units because of the way they were assembled so whether or not uh, <laughs> some of the <laughs> Units were clearly they wanted to make sure they were they got together and were installed. Others, you can tell there was somebody working on that specific railing that was very concerned about the aesthetics and were perfectionists. And so they made sure every piece was flat. There was no gaps. So you can tell different people's works in a way. We may never know their names, but it, it's really interesting as you're working on this, you feel like you're interacting with these craftsmen. And you know, you start thinking like, hey, I don't want to mess with that. When I put that together, I want to make sure it's still his work, not my work. So nice. And and, and Kathy's wondering if you also um, are cleaning the figures like the ship, et cetera, that are at the top of each column. So that's actually being handled by the Jeff Johnson um, crew, who are also doing the painting of the coffered ceiling. So we did remove those, but they're gonna be handling all of those uh, bar reliefs. So those will be installed once we're finished doing all our finishes and sealing the uh, veneer. Wonderful, well, thank you. I don't see any more questions, uh, but lots of 
people have just been so amazed at all that they've seen and can't wait to go see it in person. Fantastic. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you to Aaron Workington for giving of your time here well, with thank the you very much. to share us. And uh, for everybody who attended, you'll receive in the email a, a, a link to this program and um, it will also be up on our YouTube page if you want to share it out with other other aficionados of the State Library and of the preservation process. Thank you so much and have a wonderful afternoon. Thank you. Thank you.